In this video, I will be talking about why I think Deutasteride is better than Finasteride. Now, don't get me wrong, Finasteride is still a good first step and definitely is good for most people. However, when you look at scalp DHT suppression on 1 mg or even 5 mg Finasteride, it pales in comparison when going up against 0.5 mg of Deutasteride up to 2.5 mg of Deutasteride. And between this range, you can see about a 50 to 82% reduction in scalp DHT. Now, we care about scalp DHT more so than serum DHT because in the scalp, that's where you have your hair follicles. And it is in this particular region where when testosterone comes in contact with 5-alpha reductase, whether it's type 1 or type 2, more commonly type 2, but we'll talk about why type 1 is also a concern. When this 5-alpha reduction occurs of testosterone, you get DHT. And in that localized area, the hair follicles are obviously being attacked and miniaturized by dihydrotestosterone, DHT. So this video is mostly going to focus on why dutasteride is just simply better. And as a, you know, sort of brief for people who are in a hurry. Dutasteride blocks both type 1 and type 2 5-alpha reductase. Also, there is reason to believe that in some people, they may have a higher presence of the type 1 5-alpha reductase in the scalp. So for those people, using something like finasteride, it doesn't block that much of the type 1 5-alpha reductase. In fact, it's primarily a type 2 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So that may not be as efficacious for some people, but also dutasteride is shown to block more of that type 2 5 alpha reductase as well. So just from those two particular points alone, dutasteride is vastly more superior than finasteride when it comes to slowing down the progression of androgenetic alopecia. In fact, even when it comes to recovery rate of hair follicles, 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride has been observed to have a slightly quicker hair growth rate. So without further ado, let's get on with this video. In the realm of hair loss prevention and treatment, two pharmaceutical drugs, both FDA approved for the on-label and off-label use for treating androgenetic alopecia, are commonly used. These are finasteride and dutasteride. Both drugs have been championed for their ability to inhibit the enzyme 5-alpha reductase, which plays a pivotal role in the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, also known as DHT, a key factor in male and female pattern baldnesses. While finasteride has long held the spotlight as the go-to medication for many individuals battling hair loss, clinical studies and clinical experiences have shed light on the superiority of dutasteride in terms of efficacy, safety, and long-term benefits. In this video, I will be talking about why dutasteride might be a better choice when it comes to hair growth and hair restoration when facing androgenetic alopecia. Dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, is central to the process of androgenetic alopecia, more commonly known as male pattern baldness. While both serum and scalp DHT levels are significant when studying this condition, they serve different purposes and are reflective of how different biological processes occur. Scalp DHT specifically refers to the DHT levels in the scalp tissue where the hair follicles reside. Elevated levels of DHT on the scalp directly correlate with miniaturization of hair follicles, a defining characteristic of androgenetic alopecia. When DHT binds to the androgen receptors in these follicles, it instigates a process that shrinks the follicles over time, leading to thinner hair and eventually hair loss. Contrastingly, serum DHT provides a general overview of DHT levels throughout the body, but it might not accurately represent activity, DHT activity that is, in the scalp. For instance, an individual could have standard serum DHT levels, but significantly higher scalp DHT levels, positioning them at a risk for androgenetic alopecia. Conversely, a reduction in serum DHT doesn't always equate to diminished scalp DHT. This distinction is crucial since many treatments for androgenetic alopecia like finasteride and dutasteride aim to reduce scalp DHT levels 
to directly preserve and improve hair follicle health. But it tends to be the reality that when you impact serum DHT levels, you are going to also impact scalp DHT levels as well. However, the same reduction you get in serum is not going to be reflective in scalp DHT levels. When looking at the phase two clinical trials for dutastride titled, quote, the importance of dual 5-alpha reductase inhibition in the treatment of male pattern hair loss, results of a randomized placebo-controlled study of dutastride versus finasteride, unquote, by Ellis A. Olson et al. Both scalp levels and serum DHT levels are observed on both 5 mg oral finasteride and oral dutastride, with oral dutastride being tested at 0.5 mg and 2.5 mg. In the context of scalp DHT, dutastride doses led to a significant suppression of scalp DHT levels in comparison to placebo, with the effect increasing with the dosage. Specifically, 0.1 mg dutastride and 5 mg finasteride resulted in similar reduction of scalp DHT levels by 32% and 41% respectively. So to rephrase this, 0.1 mg dutastride and 5 mg finasteride reduced a similar range of DHT between 32% and 41%. Now, you may notice that this is talking about 5 mg oral finasteride, which not many people use. That is the ProScar dose, the Propecia dose that's commonly used for androgenetic alopecia being 1 mg is also similar in scalp DHT reduction levels. But I'll touch on that later in the video, so just keep that in mind. Don't freak out by, oh, this is just five milligram oral finasteride, that means I'm using one milligram, that means I'm, I'm missing out. No, don't freak out, we'll talk about that later on in the video. But anyway, returning back to the video. Higher doses of dutastride, 0.5 milligram and 2.5 milligram, reduce scalp DHT levels by 51% and 79% respectively. So that's pretty substantial when you're trying to combat scalp DHT levels. Moreover, all active treatments, including dutastride in varying doses from 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 2.5 milligram, and finasteride led to increases in scalp testosterone levels, ranging from 23% to a staggering 222%. And also, as a side note, don't freak out about scalp testosterone levels. I'll touch on that later on in this video because also people freak out that, you know, their scalp T levels go up and then they think, oh, I'm going to lose all my hair because, you know, scalp testosterone is going up and testosterone is an androgen and it's androgenic alopecia. So that means testosterone is going to target my hair follicles. And I'm no, no, we'll touch on that later as well. Anyway, importantly, there was a strong inverse correlation observed between the reduction in scalp DHT concentration and the increase in hair count as well as a positive assessment from panels and investigators. These correlations were statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0.001. Now, in the context of serum DHT, dutastride significantly suppressed serum DHT levels compared to placebo, with the highest suppression at 24 weeks observed in the 0.5 milligram group being 92%, and also in the 2.5 milligram group being 96.4%. So the doses of dutastride at 0.5 milligrams was 92% reduction in DHT, and the doses of dutastride at 2.5 milligrams resulted in 96.4% reduction in DHT. So even at something like 0.5 milligrams of dutastride, you're getting a, a huge amount of serum DHT suppression, and it barely goes up when you increase the dose to 2.5 milligrams. Because I mean, yeah, 92% versus 96% is, you know, there's a difference, but still, you're, you've crushed a shit ton of serum DHT. But when it came to the 0.1 milligram dutastride and finasteride groups, they both showed similar results of suppressing DHT levels by 69.8% and 73% percent respectively. So they somewhat had similar reductions in serum DHT, like we saw in scalp DHT reduction levels as well. Meanwhile, all treatment groups saw an uptick in serum testosterone levels, with the most substantial increase in the 2.5 milligram dutastride group, going up by 27.5 percent 
serum testosterone. Notably, serum DHT levels negatively correlated with hair count and assessment of vertex hair growth. By 36 weeks post-treatment, serum DHT levels had nearly returned to baseline for most groups, except the dutastride 0.5 mg group and 2.5 mg groups. For these groups, returning to baseline took a median of 86 and 155 days respectively. And just as a side note, we can probably attribute that to Dutastride's long half-life, which I'll touch on later in the video. But just to say it now, Dutastride has a half-life of, I think, five weeks. And Finastride, its half-life is between six to eight hours. So even when you stop, you know, using Dutastride, it has an extended period in terms of suppression in serum DHT levels. And even at that, it will take a while for it to also kick in when it's trying to induce its effects. So just keep that in mind. If you take Dutastride, its half-life, its mechanism of action is a bit more extended than Finastride. We actually have another supporting study that we can look at. I've put this in other videos in the past, but I also made some mistakes in those videos by also saying that in this particular study, it, it observed 0.5 milligram to 2.5 milligram dutastride versus one milligram finasteride. I just really misspoke in those videos. But in this particular study that I'm going to mention in a moment, it's observing 0.02 milligram dutastride up to 0.5 milligram dutastride versus one milligram finasteride. But anyway, this study is titled, quote, a randomized active and placebo controlled study of the efficacy and safety of different doses of dutastride versus placebo and finasteride in the treatment of male subjects with androgenetic alopecia, unquote. Long ass title, but it was written by Walter Gubin Harcha et al. And it shows dutastride ranges between 0.02 milligram to 0.5 milligram tended to be more superior than one milligram finasteride with the 0.02 milligram dutastride performing worse than one milligram finasteride. However, the 0.1 milligram dutastride and the 0.5 milligram dutastride outperformed the one milligram finasteride. Now, I find this study to be a great resource due to its methodology and high subject count. You have 917 men that participated in this study and it was both randomized and placebo controlled with different doses of the compared drug being dutastride. 0.1 milligram and 0.5 milligram of dutastride was shown to be more effective than one milligram finasteride when it came to both hair count and width. When we take a look at the phase three clinical trials of dutastride, titled, quote, efficacy, safety, and tolerability of dutastride 0.5 milligram once daily in male patients with male pattern hair loss, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three study, unquote. The study evaluated the efficacy of 0.5 milligram of dutastride against placebo in men aged 18 to 49 years with male pattern hair loss. 2.5 milligrams of dutastride was also tested as well. The primary endpoint was to measure the change in hair count per centimeter squared from baseline to six months. The results were promising. The dutastride group demonstrated a statistically significant mean increase in 12.2 per square centimeter, an 8.2% increase, while the placebo group only saw a mean increase of 4.7 per squared centimeter, a 3.2% increase. Although both groups saw an increase in hair count after three and six months, the difference between them became statistically significant only at the six month mark. This unexpected increase in the placebo group, especially in the third month mark remains unexplained, although it's postulated that seasonal factors might be at play. So this goes without saying, yes, your hair sheds at varying times and you get various waves of growth, right? And this also can occur in placebo. So some people may think, oh, well, my hair is looking better. I had a haircut. Maybe I'm not losing my hair after all. Well, maybe you just got over a temporary shed and you still do have androgenetic alopecia. Maybe your hair just got longer and you grew it out. There are still these other sort of confounding variables that for some people, it's kind of like cope. They don't want to accept that they're losing hair. But in reality, when you look at the aggregate of the data, when it comes to this particular study and other studies, the increase in total area hair count and terminal hair counts as well goes to show how different the treatment group is compared to the placebo. 
and as you can see 12.2 per centimeter squared versus 4.7 per centimeter squared is vastly different right that means dutastride the dutastride group is actually doing something but anyway moving on comparatively dutastride's inhibition of both type 1 and type 2 5 alpha reductase offers a theoretical edge over finasteride which only targets type 2. this advantage is also underscored by the fact that dutastride is significantly more potent in inhibiting both 5-AR types. And also dutastride is seen to reduce serum DHT by over 90% compared to finasteride's 70% reduction. These findings suggest that dutastride might be a superior option for male pattern hair loss treatment, also known as androgenetic alopecia. So here, again, 0.5 milligrams of dutastride was superior to 5 milligrams of finasteride in improving hair counts. However, with 2.5 milligram of dutastride, it was observed to have a slightly greater effect on hair growth rate. That is, 2.5 milligram of dutastride showcased a faster recovery in terms of hair miniaturization. And again, that's primarily due to the scalp DHT levels on 2.5 milligram of dutastride. If you significantly can suppress scalp DHT levels, the likelihood of hair regrowth as well as the reversal of much of the miniaturized hair is greater. But this could also mean you're going to have a lot of shedding, which people complain about while they're on dutastride. You could have a significant shed. Both factors increased dose-dependently with dutastride. Dutastride at 0.5 milligram significantly increased hair count and width in a 2.54 centimeter diameter, and it also improved hair growth compared to 5 milligram finasteride. So like I said earlier in this video, right, how they're using 5 milligrams of finasteride, which is typically the ProScar dose, and many of us who use finasteride are using the Propecia dose, the 1 milligram finasteride. In the phase 2 and phase 3, and also the randomized comparison of 0.02 milligram to 0.5 dutastride versus 5 milligram finasteride study that I mentioned earlier on, the Walter Gubin Harcha et al. study, you can see that ProScar is being used in this. 5 milligram finasteride is being used in this. And notably, there are going to be people that are concerned who may think, well, I have to use 5 milligram of finasteride to get that 39 or 40 percent decrease in scalp DHT. Now, there are some, you know, varying studies that say 5 milligrams of finasteride reduces scalp DHT by something like 80 percent which in those particular studies, if I recall correctly, they're short-term in terms of it being sustained, long-term duration when it's observed, it tends to be that scalp DHT levels are suppressed by between 30 to 40%. This is on five milligrams of finasteride. However, other studies also show that one milligram or finasteride has been shown to have no difference on scalp DHT and serum DHT compared to five milligram of oral finasteride. This means that one milligram oral finasteride has the equivalent suppression of scalp DHT and serum DHT as five milligram oral finasteride. I know I'm kind of repeating myself, but I just want to reiterate so people get that in their head. So when it comes to finasteride, there is no sort of dose dependency, meaning the more finasteride you use past one milligram, the greater the results, as you would see in dutastride. There is, that just doesn't exist, okay? And there's a nice review on finasteride compiled by the Stats Pearls online textbook from PubMed. The article is titled, quote, finasteride, unquote, and it's written by authors Patrick M. Zito, Carlisle G. Bistas, and Kieran Said. And their affiliations are with the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, that being Zito, for Bistas, Medical University of the Americas, and for Said, Holy Cross Hospital. So I'll leave that in the description probably, you know, hopefully put some screenshots of that article in the video. So I just want people to know that. Don't freak out. If you're taking one milligram oral finasteride, don't think you have to take five milligram finasteride to get what I'm talking about, at least what these studies compare, that sort of scalp DHT suppression between 30 to 40%. That's not the case. One milligram oral finasteride is also equivalent to five milligram oral finasteride in terms of scalp DHT suppression and also serum DHT suppression.
Safety is paramount when considering any drug for widespread use. The Phase 3 study also confirmed that 0.5 mg of dutasteride was not only more effective than placebo, but was also well tolerated. Adverse events between the dutasteride and placebo groups were statistically insignificant, and most were mild. However, sexually related adverse events such as sexual dysfunction occurred in 4.1% of the dutasteride group. This rate is consistent with the previous studies on finasteride in male pattern hair loss or androgenetic alopecia. In earlier studies, higher doses of dutasteride, specifically at 2.5 mg, were linked to a higher incident of decreased libido. So keep that in mind if you ever try to titrate up to 2.5 mg of dutasteride. It may take some time for your body to adjust to that sort of dosage, but ideally, with continual use, you should be fine. And just like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to your serum testosterone levels or serum DHT levels normalizing and coming back to normal, between 0.5 milligram to 2.5 milligram in those particular groups, after discontinuation, it'll take between 86 to 155 days for your testosterone levels to come back down to baseline and for your DHT levels to go back up to their original baseline. So keep that in mind because sometimes some of the side effects that people get when it comes to decreased libido and such, it's due to the aromatization of the excess testosterone that you may get when taking finasteride or dutasteride, especially when you're taking dutasteride at that high 2.5 milligram dose. When looking at the clinical comparison though, between 0.5 milligram dutasteride and 5 milligram finasteride in a particular clinical study titled, quote, Comparison of Clinical Trials with Finasteride and Dutasteride, unquote, by Department of Urology, Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, Canada's J. Curtis Nickel, Dr. J. Curtis Nickel. In terms of sexual side effects, dutasteride tends to show lower side effect instances in its clinical trials than finasteride, so that's pretty interesting. However, statistically, both 5 mg finasteride and 0.5 mg dutasteride have similar side effect profiles and rates. So even with dutasteride lowering more serum DHT than finasteride, it still has a similar side effect rate. But again, to reiterate for the members in the audience who are listening to this video, if you look back to those phase 3 clinical trials, we can see that that dose of 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride will yield a higher incident of decreased libido. So in conclusion, this phase 3 study provides pivotal evidence supporting the efficacy and safety of 0.5 milligram of dutasteride in treating androgenetic alopecia. Dutasteride's dual inhibition of both 5-AR isoenzymes, the type 1 and type 2, and there's also a type 3, but that isn't really important for the sake of this video. But this dual inhibition of both type 1 and type 2, and also a greater inhibition of the type 2 5-alpha reductase enzyme than finasteride can do, positions dutasteride as a potential superior alternative to treatments like finasteride. You also have other obscure 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like pistaride, which I did a video on before, but also Hair Cafe did a, a better video on it, so I guess you guys should go take, check that out too. So why might dutasteride be more efficacious than finasteride? So I've mentioned this throughout the video here and there, but let's get into this. Like I said in the previous sections, dutasteride is known to reduce more of the type 2 5 alpha reductase enzyme than finasteride can. And finasteride primarily reduces the type 2 5 alpha reductase enzyme, which is present in both the scalp and prostate. However, the type 1 5 alpha reductase is also present in the skin. So dutasteride could be more effective simply because it's reducing more of that type 2 5 alpha reductase enzyme than finasteride can. So thus, there is less of that particular type 2 5 alpha reductase presence in the scalp, and that would also further decrease scalp DHT. However, this isn't to say that type 1 5 alpha reductase cannot be present in the scalp, because after all, scalp skin is still skin, and type 1 5 alpha reductase exists there as well.
Now, there is a small scale study, but nevertheless, in concept, it shows that there is a variation in terms of the concentration of type 1 and type 2 5 alpha reductase in the scalp of men and women. In the study titled, quote, different levels of 5 alpha reductase, type 1 and type 2, aromatase and androgen receptor in hair follicles of women and men with androgenetic alopecia, unquote, by Sawaya and Pride. This study undertaken by Sawaya and Pride delves into the intricate differences in enzyme and receptor levels within hair follicles of men and women suffering from androgenetic alopecia, specifically the research targeting the androgen receptor, as well as type 1 and type 2 5-alpha reductase and the cytochrome P450 aromatase enzyme using scalp biopsies from 12 women and 12 men, all aged between 18 and 33, who displayed signs of androgenetic alopecia. One of the most pivotal findings in this particular study was that in both genders, when it came to androgenetic alopecia, there existed higher concentrations of androgen receptors and 5-alpha reductase type 1 and type 2 in frontal hair follicles, typically the thinning areas, than in the occipital follicles, usually the unaffected area. So those are like the sides of the head. Conversely, the occipital follicles of both men and women displayed elevated levels of aromatase. So again, like I've said in other videos, if you look at the donor area, usually, you know, the sides of the head, the occipital lobe, those areas are typically unaffected by dihydrotestosterone or they're more resistant to DHT. And in this particular study, as well as many others, but I'm going to focus on this one right now, it finds that in that particular donor region, there's less 5-alpha reductase activity, there are fewer androgen receptors, and there's an elevated level of aromatase. So this is like really, really interesting stuff here. I wish that the study was expanded to have a higher population count with, you know, more control groups and such. That would definitely solidify this study, and I can see this in concept excellently with a bigger population size. The study also revealed significant quantitative variances in the levels of androgen receptors in the trio of enzymes, predominantly in the outer root sheath of the hair follicles across genders. For instance, female frontal hair follicles contained approximately 40% fewer androgen receptors than their male counterparts. Furthermore, the cytochrome P450 aromatase content in the frontal follicles of women was a staggering six times higher than in men. But again, getting back to the sort of variance in 5-alpha reductase, different variations of the enzyme types in the scalp, it appeared that in the hairline regions, like I mentioned before, that there's a greater concentration of type 1 5-alpha reductase than there is type 2. And we can see, just again in concept, right, maybe some people have more type 1 5-alpha reductase in their scalp and in their hair follicles. Maybe they have greater type 2. In any case, if, let's say like these are the cases, right? Let's say that there are people who have greater type 1 or more type 2 5-alpha reductase enzyme in the scalp and hair follicles. It would stand to reason, at least for me, right? Even though finasteride is good in a majority of cases, if you want to block more of that type 2, and if you want to completely reduce that type 1, then using a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, particularly like dutasteride, can accomplish that goal of yours and could be more efficacious in the long run when it comes to just decreasing and suppressing scalp DHT. So now the takeaway, at least my opinion on this. <laughs> So research has consistently indicated a more robust correlation between scalp DHT levels and the progression of hair loss than between serum DHT levels and hair loss. Understanding the systemic presence of DHT is essential, but the hair follicle's local environment primarily governs hair growth or loss. Moreover, some treatments might effectively lower serum DHT without a comparable impact on scalp DHT. As such, when evaluating the efficacy of hair loss treatments, it's vital to assess their influence on scalp DHT, given its direct connection to hair follicle health and the progression of the androgenetic alopecia stages. In the broader context of hair loss studies and interventions, it becomes clear that while both serum and scalp DHT are valuable markers, 
it's the localized concentration of DHT in the scalp that plays a more direct role in influencing hair health in people that are genetically susceptible to DHT. Now, again, this isn't to say that finasteride won't help you. It's not, I'm not trying to say that finasteride isn't good for you, but for people who, you know, people who tend to be, I guess, more severe, at least in my opinion, more severe in their androgenetic alopecia stages, maybe you're at a Norwood for diffusely thinning and you want to gain some ground before you go for a hair transplant or anything like that, maybe dutasteride is something that you could look into, right? I think in countries like South Korea, Japan, and I think Taiwan as well, I could be wrong about that, but they outright have dutasteride approved for the use of androgenetic alopecia. So that Avidart 0.5 milligram dutasteride variation is approved to treat androgenetic alopecia and also, of course, benign prosthetic hyperplasia as well. So although here in the United States, where I am, it's not outright approved, dutasteride is not outright approved for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia, it is approved for BPH, and it is used off-label for treating androgenetic alopecia. In any case, you have two reputable nations, three, Japan, South Korea, and the United States, all overall approving the use of this drug. But also you have South Korea, again, the South Korean FDA, extremely diligent, looking at clinical data and approving it for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. So these particular drugs, both dutasteride and finasteride, are very good treatments to slow down, halt, and even reverse androgenetic alopecia. But it just so happens to be that dutasteride might be a bit more efficacious and could be a bit more efficacious in the long run than finasteride. Especially at the 2.5 milligram dosage, your potential of getting hair regrowth is a bit more higher than, say, 1 milligram or 5 milligram finasteride or 0.5 milligram dutasteride. And also, although this is like we're going towards the end of this video, I want to iterate again once more. When I mention 5 milligram in these studies, 5 milligram finasteride, I have to say that one milligram finasteride has the same serum and scalp DHT suppression as five milligram dutasteride. The researchers just simply used five milligram dutasteride because it was proscar and I guess it was more easily obtainable and it provided a more uniformed study. So don't freak out. One milligram finasteride will suppress just as much DHT as five milligram finasteride. So I'm not sure if I'm going to include this segment in the Dutasteride is better than Finasteride video or if I'll upload it separately, but nevertheless, here it is. This is a side note on the possibility of testosterone contributing to androgenetic alopecia. To many people that claim that Dutasteride made their hair worse, this is for you. Because if you take Dutasteride, you run the possibility of going through an accelerated shed as a significant amount of scalp DHT is suddenly reduced which causes the hair follicles to kind of synchronize a bit more than finasteride hair follicles would normally. Again, depending on the dosage, your and also your genetics as well, you're decreasing scalp DHT between 50% to 80%. Who knows, there could be people going above that 80% range. And if you're taking that dose between 0.5 milligram to 2.5 milligram. Okay, so this is for those people. For some people, this shedding can last for some months, and for others, it can cause different parts of the scalp to shed at different times. So it is definitely a jarring experience, but it doesn't mean the drug stopped working, as many folks online say. People that say Dutasteride made my hair worse, it's not working, whatever. Now, people will also talk about the increase in scalp testosterone levels. But this increase in scalp testosterone isn't why you're balding. The idea that testosterone is also the enemy leads to people doing extreme things such as experimental topical antiandrogens and even taking oral antiandrogens, believe it or not, which if you're a male to female trans identifying person, then I guess there's no issue there. You know, you know the consequences of such an endeavor. So you do what you want to do. And if that makes you feel better, then certainly go for it. But if you aren't somebody that identifies with that kind of, I guess you can say, gender identity, then, well, I guess it seems like a bad idea to do that to yourself. Taking an oral antiandrogen as a cis male and then, I don't know, again, people do what they do because they want to, but 
if you're not really informed and you really do think that testosterone is the enemy, then don't do something stupid and look into the research a bit more. But I'm going to help people here who presume that it's their scalp testosterone that is fucking up their hair. So let's go through some points, right? We're going to use some points of logic and also research as well. This first part is going to involve a little bit of, I guess, mathematical reasoning. DHT is about two to five times more potent than testosterone. Some studies even show that it could be 10 times more potent. So decreasing DHT for testosterone doesn't increase the androgenic effects that occur on the scalp. It would actually be the opposite due to DHT's potency. If we consider the binding affinity of testosterone to the androgen receptor as binding testosterone, and if you can look at the screen, we're going to be using some mathematical variables. So we have this mathematical variable, binding testosterone. And if we consider the binding affinity of dihydrotestosterone to the androgen receptor as binding DHT, it's established that binding DHT is twice that of binding testosterone. Furthermore, if we present the disassociation rate of testosterone as disassociation testosterone, and that of dihydrotestosterone as disassociation DHT, we can state that the disassociation DHT is one-fifth of disassociation testosterone, given that DHT disassociates five times slower than testosterone. Now, again, this sounds like word salad, so please look at the screen, because if you can't, I just want to let you know I'm showing some some of my math reasoning here. And if there are any like more math endowed people in the audience, you're welcome to uh, inform me better on this part if you want to. But anyway, let's keep going. The androgenic effect of a hormone is directly related to its binding affinity and inversely related to its disassociation rate. Thus, the androgenic effect of testosterone is proportional to binding testosterone divided by disassociation testosterone and the androgenic effect of dihydrotestosterone is proportional to binding DHT divided by disassociation DHT. Using these relationships, we can deduce that the androgenic effect of dihydrotestosterone is 10 times that of testosterone. This indicates that for each unit of testosterone that gets converted to dihydrotestosterone, its androgenic effect is magnified about tenfold. If we inhibit this conversion process, we retain the androgenic effect of testosterone but miss out on the tenfold increase from dihydrotestosterone. By halting the conversion, we retain the androgenic effect of testosterone but lose ten times that effect from dihydrotestosterone, resulting in a net loss of nine times the androgenic effect of testosterone. This implies a reduction of the overall androgenic effect. Hence, inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone always leads to a decline in overall androgenicity, regardless of how much of the conversion is inhibited. So we have some sentential logic, right? Premise 1, binding affinity and disassociation rate. Given DHT has double the binding affinity to the androgen receptor compared to testosterone, DHT has a disassociation rate five times slower than testosterone. Premise two, the androgenic effect of a hormone is determined by its binding affinity and its disassociation rate. So using the relationships from premise one, this implies that DHT has a 10 times more androgenic effect of testosterone in tissues where it's active. And finally, for premise three, inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to DHT increases the amount of testosterone but decreases the amount of DHT. So for every unit of testosterone not converted to DHT, you're going to witness a decline in the androgenic activity in the scalp. Because again, DHT is just more effective and more potent. So just on this first point alone, even if there is an increase in scalp testosterone due to the inhibition of its conversion to DHT, the overall androgenic effect in the scalp decreases. This is because the androgenic effect of the DHT that would have been produced is 10 times more potent, or, you know, it just is about X times more potent, if we're using the higher bound, 10 times more potent than the increase in the androgenic effect from the additional T. Hence, inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to DHT will result in a decrease in the overall androgenicity in the scalp 
irrespective of the increase of scalp testosterone. Now, the second point. Here, DHT and testosterone transcribe different genetic messages when they combine with the androgen receptor. I'm going to be reading from this particular study titled, quote, Modulation of Androgen Receptor Activation Function 2 by Testosterone and Dihydrotestosterone, unquote, by Askew et al. This study looks at how two male hormones, testosterone and DHT, affect the androgen receptor. This receptor plays a big role in things like muscle growth, bone health, and male reproductive development. It should also be noted that it plays a role in prostate health, as well as, you guessed it, male pattern baldness or androgenetic alopecia. While both testosterone and DHT can activate the androgen receptor, DHT does it more effectively. Imagine testosterone and DHT were keys, and the androgen receptor was a lock. Both keys can unlock the androgen receptor, however, DHT is a better fit and it turns the lock more smoothly. The authors state how DHT is required for male sexual development, whereas testosterone is the major androgen in muscle growth and muscle composition in puberty. The doctors also reference Imperato McGinley, which we will look at later, about how even with normal levels of testosterone without turning into DHT, a male fetus will not completely develop male genitalia. Now I have one more part after this, a third reasoning why testosterone isn't the enemy when it comes to scalp DHT, but just to touch on this before we get on to that third part, in that next point I'll talk about the pseudohermaphrodites that were essentially men who were born with low levels of DHT due to having low 5-alpha reductase type 2 enzymes. This was a genetic defect that they had. Looking at Imperato McGinley et al. 1974 research on pseudohermaphrodites, these men often presented as infant girls upon their birth, having ambiguous or nearly feminine looking genitalia. However, during puberty, these men would develop full and normally sized penises, suggesting that testosterone can also be inversely used in maintaining and developing sexual characteristics. So in this regard, we have some sort of a close fit, but not a nearly perfect role of DHT, that being testosterone that steps in. But that isn't the same for androgenetic alopecia. So I think I'm digressing, but back to the Askew et al. paper. The researchers found that around a tenfold higher concentration of testosterone is required to achieve the androgen receptor mediated transcriptional effects of DHT. So this means for every one molecule of DHT, you need about 10 times the same amount of testosterone to achieve the same genetic effects that would induce something like androgenetic alopecia. But that isn't possible with just testosterone alone, because it's not like you can jam 10 testosterones into a single receptor. So essentially, it's saying like, the only way you can get that sort of potency is if testosterone becomes DHT. So testosterone would have to become something entirely different it can't be itself in order to achieve these greater transcriptional effects when it comes to DNA. You should understand that when testosterone comes in contact with the androgen receptor, or when DHT does so as well, it forms a testosterone androgen receptor complex, or a DHT androgen receptor complex. These complexes move into the cell nucleus where it interacts with DNA. You can imagine that this complex, due to its structure of DHT, or testosterone acts like a ring as it slides along your DNA. Here, certain genes are interacted with and some are not. Some are turned on and some are not at all. It depends on your genes, of course. So allow me to reiterate a bit more clearly. Both testosterone and DHT can activate the androgen receptor, but DHT does it more effectively. Again, imagine if testosterone and DHT were keys and that the androgen receptor was a lock. Both keys can unlock it, but it is DHT that is a better fit, and it can turn the lock more smoothly. Back to the genetic basis, it is DHT that can transcribe more messages or different messages than testosterone can. That's why it's so potent. So, in this case, like we will observe in the Imperacto McKinley reasoning in the next point, it appears as if DHT is activating the genes that are involved with androgenetic alopecia, and testosterone cannot. The researchers for this particular Askew et al. study 
further substantiate their claims by looking at the structure of these complexes. The primary difference in chemical structure between DHT and testosterone is that testosterone has a double bond between the fourth and fifth carbon atoms in its A ring, while DHT does not have this double bond, making its A ring saturated. It's worth looking at how the researchers were able to determine this, so I'm going to provide a gleam into their methodology. The researchers conducted a series of experiments referred to as biochemical data to understand how two hormones, testosterone and DHT, interact with the androgen receptor. Their findings revealed that testosterone does not activate the androgen receptor as potently as DHT. One of the primary reasons for this difference is testosterone's weaker interaction with specific sections of the androgen receptor, known as the FXXLF and the LXXLL motifs, particularly in a spot labeled as AF2. So again, like I mentioned before, testosterone and DHT are fitting differently when it comes to the androgen receptor, and their respective receptor complexes, the DHT androgen receptor complex versus the testosterone androgen receptor complex, potentially interact with DNA differently. Now moving on to our third point when it comes to testosterone not being the enemy of your hair follicles. It's actually DHT. So in this third point, we're going to be looking at men who are genetically deficient in the type 2 5 alpha reductase enzyme that never went bald despite having normal to high normal levels of testosterone as seen in the research of Imperato McGinley et al. 1974 in the paper titled, quote, steroid 5 alpha reductase deficiency in men, an inherited form of male pseudohermaphroditism, unquote. Imperato McGinley et al. 1974 make note of these men and how, quote, they develop a typical male phenotype with a substantial increase in muscle mass, unquote, along with also, quote, no temporal recession, unquote. So they didn't have any recession at their hairline. They had full heads of hair, essentially. The extended quote also mentions how many of these men, when they were born, presented as female infants with ambiguous genitalia. But upon puberty, these men developed full and normal-sized penises, so this harkens back to the second point I made previously when talking about the askew et al. modulation of androgen receptors and how testosterone and DHT interact with the androgen receptor. So let us reiterate on this particular Imperacto McGinley study. And by the way, it took place in the Dominican Republic. So these Dominican pseudohermaphrodites were born with a type 2 5 alpha reductase deficiency which caused them to have significantly lower DHT levels. They still had some DHT levels because they still had the type 1 5 alpha reductase enzyme. However, them not having much type 2 5 alpha reductase made their baseline DHT substantially lower, and thus they never went bald. And this is the reasoning, right? This is the reasoning why we use finasteride because it is a type 2 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. And we also use dutastride as well because it is a stronger type 2 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. It seems as if when you reduce type 2 5 alpha reductase, you're going to reduce the presence of DHT in the scalp. So, just these three points alone, from the first point with the mathematical reasoning when it came to the androgenicity of decreasing the scalp's androgenicity by preventing testosterone turning into DHT, also the second point where we talk about how testosterone and DHT actually transcribe different genetic messages. And finally, to the third point, looking at Imperacto McKinley's study on the pseudohermaphrodites who were born with a 5-alpha reductase type 2 deficiency, which caused them to be deficient in DHT. And in these men, when they went through puberty and past puberty, they didn't bald on their scalps. They had no signs of temporal recession. They had full heads of hair. Again, these three points alone are enough to show us that testosterone isn't the enemy when it comes to male pattern baldness. So anyone that keeps talking about this, they need to stop. Testosterone isn't causing or I'll be charitable. It isn't significantly progressing your androgenetic alopecia. It's DHT. And if you're on a nuclear stack, maybe you just are super sensitive to DHT, and perhaps a topical anti-androgen is your only go-to bet. So yeah, that's the end of this part. So 
I guess that's it for this video. If you got this far into this video, comment in the comment section below, green star. Yes, green star. That's going to be this particular part's fancy word to see if you guys actually got to the end of this video. So thanks for watching, guys, and I hope to see you on the next one. Peace out.